Um, I want to change directions here. The one thing I think I saw in your book that I didn't see in your blogs, and I might be mistaken, you talked about drugs. And this was very interesting to me. You've been very candid about your cocaine use, which yep. I thought was pretty great, actually, very interesting. Uh, somebody my age, uh, born you know in 1969 and raised in the just say no, the whole idea of just cocaine being around in restaurants is just strange and odd to me. But uh, you you didn't get addicted per se. That's what the thing I'm curious about. How did you take so much cocaine and not get addicted? Can you explain this? <laughs> How well, you know. Um... I used it for work, mostly, mostly for work. Uh, you know, you, you would you would get into a certain uh, mood, a, you, you, you'd get lit, and you would light up the people around you. And you'd get actually, I don't know, I'll say it, uh, I, I found that it, it that it did uh, spur creativity. It, it initiated uh, creativity, and and it uh, you know it got you going. Sure. So um, I came to depend on it for those magic three or four hours after dinner when we did our best work. Um, as I said, I always had it. I didn't always use it, but I didn't ever want to be without it, you know, for until I was, God, somewhere in my early 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and it's, you know, I, I, I thought it was a casual, you know, party favor. And um, but I did come to depend on it and I did have to reeducate myself to be sociable without it mm -hmm. my body began to began to tell me that it didn't like it so so eventually i stopped but i had a pretty uh honest honestly a pretty enjoyable relationship with cocaine yeah. you know uh i people used to, <laughs> people said did you do drugs when you were a record producer and i said well you know I, I think I probably put several fleets of very expensive imported cars up my nose. <laughs> yeah. It was, um, it was a lot of money. And you had ways to clean up, you know, ways to detox. For absolutely. Absolutely. I would, between albums, I would um, fast, you know, I would not, I would not do drugs. I would not drink and I would clean up so that I could, you know, abuse myself for the next album right and you ended up doing cocaine a lot longer than your colleagues apparently yes i did <laughs> I, I would guess you know probably five to ten years yeah longer so there's the there's the moral kitties if you just clean up periodically you can take drugs longer thank you we'll, we'll see you <laughs> next time <laughs> please I do not want to promote drug use. <laughs> You're right. I think we've learned enough about that. But it is interesting to me to, to, you know, to talk to you having been through that. From my perspective, I thought if I was in that situation, no way. I could never do that. It's fascinating. Another thing that you did all these years was you maintained a single marriage, which is remarkable to me, too, even more remarkable than the drugs. How did you do that, given all you were doing? How, how often were you home? I mean, how did you maintain a wife and children and keep it healthy well with difficulty um but it, it hasn't been that hard we've been married 55 years and together for 62 um i love her you know <laughs> that helps that helps uh we've worked at it it's not you know it, it's not the simplest thing in the world you do have to work at it um, and, um, you know, we, we, I love my kids. We, we had a very tight, we have a very tight family and our kids actually enjoy being with us, which is fortunate at this age. Yeah. Um, it was fun. Uh, it, it was good to be home. Uh, I didn't go away that much. I did for 
you know, like Molly Hatchet, I used to travel to Orlando and and occasionally I'd go away for up to 12 days, but ne but never anymore. If it got to be 12 days, I would insist on going home for a few days. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it wasn't it, it it wasn't all that hard. It wasn't like everyone else. You know, it wasn't like Ozzy and Harriet, but um we didn't we didn't have any um any real bumps in the road. That's great. And your kids apparently enjoyed <clears throat> the exposure they were able to get to the fun world you lived in too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh they met Michael Jackson. That was the biggest thing in their lives up to that point. You know, I was really uh, happy to to be able to introduce them to th that world, to the, the world of, of music. It made them, um, they enjoyed it and, and it made them special among their friends, you know, yeah. and, uh, and they're very musical, very musical. Got some of the genes. Did your wife enjoy the, proximity to uh show business as well not not really she didn't dislike it you know she likes she loves music uh but um you know she didn't like the aspects of the record business that made me different from who i was at home yeah you know that's the deal uh, there are a few, what am I saying? A few, there are hundreds of great stories in this book, literally one after the other. Uh, I don't want to give most of them away. I want people to buy the book, but I do want to talk about a couple of stories. Just, these are the, some of the less interesting stories and yet worth talking about. Um, you passed on meatloaf. I want to know if you remember deciding not to, to, to follow up on meatloaf. Yeah, okay. sure. It was, it was instantly. I mean, Meat and Jim Steinman came in. Steinman sat down at the piano. We had pianos in our offices. And he played and Meat sang and, and shook the walls. You know, he, he it was thunderous. And um, I remember saying that I, uh, I didn't think Epic was up to it. I didn't think Epic would know how to record and promote and market this guy. I said, you know, you're you're uh, unique, you're incredible, but and so I did introduce him to my boss, Steve Popovich, um, and he when he shortly thereafter left a CBS and started Cleveland International Records and signed Meatloaf. So yeah. I, you know, yeah, yes, I passed, but I passed him on. You yeah. Know. Okay. So it wasn't as if you heard his demo and didn't, didn't said catch no. it. No, right. no. You uh, you knew he was going somewhere. I yeah. I and I got him actually to sing on, on one of Ted Nugent's records before he was signed. Right. Uh, not before Ted was signed. Before Meatloaf was signed. Um. After he did that audition for me, uh, you know, I called him up and flew him down to Atlanta to. Uh, to sing on 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 the free for all album, yeah, very strange. Another story I'd like you to relate <laughs> is the Ozzy Dove story. Could you tell that story, please? Well, you know, you never know exactly what was real. I'm I'm pretty sure that Ozzy did bite the head off of a dead bat in concert when somebody threw a dead bat up on the stage. I'm I, I, that's what I've heard. Also heard that, uh, you know, in this particular epic marketing meeting, um, Ozzy was brought in as, as a special guest and he brought some, he brought doves with him. And he, and apparently, uh, you know, the story is that he sat down on the lap of one of the uh, women who worked for the company and bit the head off one of the doves. You weren't in the room, though. I was not in the room, and uh, I can't remember exactly what the source of this particular story was, but I know that he was, uh, people were disgusted, and he was immediately asked to leave. 
you know. Uh, so it wasn't funny. You know, it was repulsive. Yeah. Um, most of the other stories in the book are accurate and and I was there. But but this one was just uh, re reported. And Vince told me about Ozzy snorting a line of ants. <laughs> okay, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite story from the book that you want to tell? Uh, I, you know, I, what, what, what did you like? Well, we already talked about in a different interview, we already talked about the paint story, the walls of the office story. So I don't want yeah, to do that yeah. again. That's a great story. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of my favorite stories. I mean, I like the bunny Carlos gone fishing thing, um, which we talked about in another interview. Now, I really want to know. The favorite, the story you liked to tell the most, the one that maybe you'd forgotten about or that you just love to tell. Well, let's see. I uh, can't tell that the one about Ted. Uh, oh, you talk. I think that's my that is my favorite the, the, with the glass of milk and the the bed. Oh, oh, that that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's there the was story. One, the popcorn. No, uh, no, no. Don't tell the popcorn. Save that for the book. That's. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, I wanna, I'm talking about when you found him in bed with, okay, okay. you can tell this story. Uh, you know, I we went uh, back to the hotel after uh, a show. Uh, I, I would go out on the road sometimes with my artists and, you know, see him live. And I wanted to talk to him about something and I called him up and he said, come on up. We'll talk here. Door will be open. So I went up to his hotel room and I walked in and saw him in bed <clears throat> with his arms around two very young looking girls, uh, like the girl next door, cute, yeah. probably blonde, you know. Um, and he had a glass of warm milk on the night table. And I kind of thought he had set this whole thing up for my benefit. <laughs> but uh, I asked him later about, you know, the girls. And I said, how, what's the deal? How old were they? How did you do this? And, you know, without, without going to jail. And he said, uh, well, you know, I go to their parents and I ask them, uh, if the girls wanted to come on the road with me for a weekend or one show, um, would they rather the girls came with me or dated, went out on a date with some one of their high school guys who drank and did drugs? And of course, you know, he said that's how he got the parents' permission. From you know, so he 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 said he always liked clean young girls. He now, said he said clean. I, I got it. So I know I sound stupid asking this. Was he having sex with them, or was he just in bed with them? I do not know. Yeah, I do not know. I would assume that there there may have been something more than friendship involved I, okay. I i i don't know we we never went there yeah i was just curious it's not in the book and i've just the whole thing is so odd that why not ask all the questions you know? right right yeah well um we'll have to get him on the show <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> send He's him my way about that stuff yeah um uh, there's one more story that I didn't enjoy, but I was glad you put in the book, and it's a very sad story. Here you are at the end of a brilliant career, trying to pivot, trying to talk to all these people you've worked with for 20 years, yeah. and you got treated the way they would have treated me. Like, nobody will even give you five minutes. After a career of platinum albums and hits and stuff, that blows my mind. No, it's what have you done for me this week? Yeah, you know it's it's and it it really is uh, uh, unfortunately the way of the record business and and the record business is probably the 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 shallowest and and rudest 
of the of of the three entertainment businesses: movies, TV, and music. Um, yeah, it, it it was it was truly un un unbelievable. Not only didn't they buy my idea, which which I think was I still think was a very good idea because many of those labels disappeared shortly thereafter. Um, they were just, I don't know, they were just rude. And, uh, you know, with the, um, especially the example of um, the uh, the one with Atlantic Records, and I'm, I just didn't dare say their real names because no one could prove but I, you know, the, the the actual facts that that I wrote about. It's not necessary. I mean, all you have to say is that yeah, it's not necessary to name names, and you get the right. message. So if, yeah. I don't know if we filled in enough of the dots for the audience here. You are trying to get a meeting with somebody yeah. in Atlantic, and they're saying, "Yeah, come see me tomorrow," and you come tomorrow, and they don't show up. Right. You know, that, no, that that was the fourth. The fourth. The fourth uh, time you tried to meet with them, right. Yeah. You'll pass them in restaurants and they won't mention it. Right. You know, I mean, and this is you after your career has had its full blossom. So that's yeah, right. You blows know, my mind. They all said, we, Tom, we respect, you know, if I got to see them, they said, Tom, we respect what you've done and, you know, and admire your blah, blah, blah. We don't need what you're offering, you know, basically. Yeah. Um, but but the uh, the callousness the, the 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 rude behavior that they exhibited was un, was true truly incredible. Um, you know, I was pretty I was pretty uh, pretty surprised and pretty disappointed by that. Yeah, you published a very insightful paragraph by a man named Andrew Hickey. Uh, and I'm going to read what he wrote that you put in there. <laughs> and this is applying apparently to executives and to the rock stars, uh, many of whom were also very uh, harsh to you after you assisted them. The scene was not one that would tend to produce particularly nice people, simply because it involved taking charismatic but often rather damaged young men, still in or barely out of adolescence, telling them they're geniuses, giving them large amounts of amphetamines, and then fulfilling their every narcissistic desire. It's honestly amazing that any of them were even remotely tolerable human beings at all. <laughs> I think that's well put. Yeah, yeah. Well, how did you resist this? I mean, clearly this is all around you. Didn't you think, well, maybe this is how you get ahead? You never went down that path. You, you treat people well. What's up with you? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Well, um, you know, I did start saying in the it, once I learned uh, about the downside, the bad side of the record business, I um, I kind I told people, well, what what I think is happening is that people are looking at me, and I've always tried to do the right thing. My father told me always do the right thing, regardless of you know whether it's it'll help you or not it's you have to do the right thing I, you know i figured that people said well what about worman he's he's a good guy let's let's screw him let's take advantage of him <laughs> you know <laughs> because i'm you know i was kind of hey let's all you know the kumbaya let's you know mm -hmm. uh, i'm 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 ready to do business the right way. Okay, well, you know, uh, there are, I think there are more, uh, what, um, untrustworthy people in the record business than in most other entertainment fields. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's nice about your story is that it didn't really cost you that much to be nice. Right. Right. Um, they needed, you know, one of the things uh, that 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 was, it's cruel to a little bit cruel to say, um, but which is true is that I was safe in the studio because they needed me. You know, they 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 couldn't they couldn't screw me and they couldn't screw around with me because they needed me 
to make them look good. You know, yeah, they have hits. Another so, reason why the producer's chair is a nice place to be. The the why the what producer's chair? Another reason why the oh, producer's yes. chair is a nice place to be. Oh, it, it was it was great. It was great. It was it was just, I mean, where else can you go to work, sit down, listen to listen to music, and just have thoughts and say, you know, I think we should. I think we should put a Hammond organ there, or I think we should harmonize this, and let's try that, and then do it, and that that's better. That's actually better. Let's try something else to improve it even more. And this is what you do for a living, and you get paid for it. Yeah, I mean that's for me. There is truly nothing else in the world that that could have been more enjoyable. You know, and that's how I got through 52 albums. Yeah. It, it was fun. It was fun. Almost every time. Right. And you know the ones that weren't. Yeah, yeah, you could hear it, right? <laughs> yeah. You, uh, in the 70s, you know, late 70s, early 80s, when you're making these records, uh, you could not have probably predicted what making music would be like in the 19, in the 2010s and 2020s. Uh, back then, you were striving for a kind of perfection as you made the records. Now you can attain it. Um, so what's, yeah. how would you talk about the balance between achieving, per, achieving what you were looking for as perfection in the 70s versus being able to attain it now and maybe not ending up with something satisfying? Well, it, it just doesn't, it's man versus machine. It's, you know, it's organic music versus synthetic music. Yeah. We, the, you know, the, the fact is the bottom line is that we listened to music and today you look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who are making music, look at those lines and they say, you know, let's take this chorus and put it here. And they do immediately. Bing, bing. And, and, and it's all digital and it's all perfect. And it's and much of it is sampled and I don't know I I don't even know how how records are made anymore, but um, as I said we I I like doing it the organic way, um, with real people playing real instruments, and I think that the durability of a of a song, uh, you know, is dependent on that because i've i've heard I, I have a playlist as i said in the book i i have a workout playlist for the gym and and a friend uh, a young friend some one of our friends kids made me uh, a, a short playlist of new songs songs you know from now mm -hmm. and uh, i like them very much initially and after two or three weeks they didn't inspire me anymore. Mm -hmm. They kind of wore out. And meanwhile, I'm uh, I'm listening to songs that I've listened to for 40 years. And I'm listening to them twice a week or three times a week. And they still inspire the hell out of me. They still make me stronger in the gym. You know, I have more endurance. I really need that music to to get me going um and and yes it, it, they still work they work every time i think they'll work forever your best guess is this your relationship with this music or do you think it's something inherent in the music it's something inherent in the music oh well you know i'm i'm a sap when it comes to music i'm very moved in in a number of ways by different kinds of music um there is a certain style there is a certain genre uh, of of music that um that i need to energize me and that's local that's a locomotive uh presentation like cz top yeah uh you know if you 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 cannot put on lagrange and and not get going you, right. you know it, it's just a 
it's just a drive shaft yeah. you know that's my favorite yeah yeah um, you see the picture in there with billy gibbons you know there's no. a picture a picture of me with billy oh where, yeah, in the, in the book. Right in the I, yes, book. yes, yes. I did, see that. I did see that. That's right. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, if you could change music today, let's just say you could wave your magic wand um, no. and you could turn it into anything you wanted. I mean, we've almost been talking about this already, but would you change it? What would you turn it into? You know, I I bring guitars back mainly. Um I'd like it, uh, you know. I'd like it to be more like the Eagles. I'd like, I'd like to have uh, have people play uh, country rock and, uh, you know, real acoustic fretted in inst instruments and, uh, you know, not computer generated. Yeah. I want real. I'd like real instruments, real, honest, honest recording. That's all. I mean, I, I, I'm i very fond of some, um, you know, electronic music, which is, of course, all digital and all computerized and all uh, synthesized. But um, most of the time, it just, it just doesn't do it for me. I know, you know, I, I admit that I don't look for it. The The music I'm talking about is in the grocery store or the department store. And I hear, I hear these girls wailing, you know, and, and trying to fit as many notes as possible into one bar. And uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't move me at all. I need to be moved. I need to feel some emotion from the music. Yeah. That's it. Well, um, I'm happy to say that your albums have done that for me. Thank you very much for the work that you You're did welcome. with those bands. Um, the book is Turn It Up by Tom Wehrman, the long-awaited book by Tom Wehrman. And mm. uh, you said the release date is November the... 21st. November the 21st. So okay. be on the lookout for it. Um, this interview will probably air after that, so you will have been able to find it at this point. Um, right. Tom Wehrman, uh, thank you for coming back on our show. It is always a lot of fun to talk to you. Do it as many times as you want. That sounds great. We'll find another way to get you back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for joining us once again on this trip. Um, we hope you have enjoyed these videos. If you do, drop us a line, let us know, and tell people about us. Thanks very much, folks. We'll see you next time.